Good afternoon, Oakstone. Good to see everybody. Good to see the visitors here. Glad to welcome back to the booths, by the way. They're here full time again, so welcome back. We're glad to have you, and we're super glad you're back. Yeah. And uh, welcome to all the other uh, visitors, and um, we just hope that today can be a blessing to you. And uh, welcome to everyone on the stream. Uh, last point of business, thank you guys for the worship. Really enjoyed the worship today, so thank you so much for the time um, and, and the, the prayers that were put into that. Um, when I'm preparing uh, for a message, it's always, uh, it's like a lot of seeking God to try to figure out where is it that you, where is it that you want me to go with it? Um, what, what is it uh, that the congregation needs? It's not, I, I always try to endeavor to not be what I want to talk about. And I think that's true of everyone uh, who, who speaks here. We, we endeavor very much to, to stay from the things that would maybe be apparent on the surface of what it looks like we're supposed to talk about. Um, so this is what I want to talk about really briefly is not necessarily the message for today, but I think it's germane and relevant to the time in which we are. Uh, as everyone knows, we're coming up on Halloween. I think I'm speaking to a room full of people here who don't really keep Halloween. That said, we still wanted to, to just mention a couple things about that. In Deuteronomy 12, verses 29, um, uh, God is talking to his people and he says, when, when the Lord, your God, cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess and you displace them and dwell in their land. So he's saying, look, you're going to be joined in a place that is um, uh, surrounded by people that, though cut off, uh, you're primarily going to be the, the nation of my focus. You will be a uh, theocratically driven nation and that you will be following uh, me as your king. Um, and God's saying, listen, take heed to yourselves that you are not ensnared to follow them, the nations around you after they are destroyed from before you, and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? I will do likewise. You shall not worship Yahweh your God in that way. And just as a reminder, and I don't want to say this every week, but just as a reminder, in case you're not familiar, the, the, the all capital Lord there, that is, that is the substitution for Yahweh. So we're going to just be using the, the Justin translation, or I sub that on the fly. Um, you shall not worship Yahweh your God in that way for every abomination to Yahweh which he hates they have done to their gods for they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods whatever I command you be careful to observe it you shall not add to it nor take away from it now um, with Halloween coming up it is essentially this there is a, a pristine layer put over the top of something that is dirty and filthy Halloween has a um, uh, really diverse origins, and it depends how far back you go, but it's really, in its essence, it's a hodgepodge mix-up of a bunch of different celebrations, some more innocuous than others. But at its core is a day that celebrates death, celebrates uh, the macabre, gloom. Um, if, if you just take it on for those three elements alone, you would ask, where are these three elements in God's kingdom? God is a God of life, and certainly death has its place, but God is a God of life and of the living, not a God of the dead. And so, in a God of the macabre, God is of the bright, of the day, and of gloom, and of, the, uh, of all these other things that, that Halloween represents. You won't find that in the kingdom of God. And so, there's a mixing of worship. And you may say, Halloween, it's not really worship. It's kids, you know, it's trick-or-treating or whatever. I would counter with this. There are those who have experiences that you do not have. Uh, there are those that have experiences who have come out of the occult. And God has gotten a hold of their lives, taken them out, and placed them into his kingdom. And it, almost to a T, if you talk to these people, they will say, have nothing to do as a Christian with Halloween. It is a gateway. It opens up doors you don't want open. It is not what it seems on the surface. So um, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to bring that to the to the. And encourage if any of us want to or find the allure in that, because certainly the devil does put an allure over these things. There is an allure to the um, kind of the mysterious and the dark at times. Um, God says, come out of that. In Revelation 18, 1, he says, this is the um, kind of a look into the spiritual realm that Revelation gives us. It says, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying this, 
Babylon the great is fallen, has fallen and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. This, this picture that is being painted here, it's the personification of a kingdom It's almost like it's peeling back the layer and you're able to see kind of the inner workings of what this kingdom is on the inside, right? The the spiritual that's behind this, this physical um, or really metaphorical kingdom, Babylon, you peel back the the layer and what you see is uh, a dwelling place of demons, prisons of every foul spirit and cages for unclean and hidden first. It's it's an infested place of vermin and filth and, and nothing good. And what does God say? He says, of another voice from heaven saying, come out, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues for her sins have reached to heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. This is the essence of what comprises Halloween. God is telling us, there's something better for you. Come out of it, my people. Don't take part in this. Don't take part in the plagues. Don't take part in the things that would bring death. Take part of life instead. He sets before us life and death, blessing and cursing. He says, choose life. Why would we choose death and cursing? So, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but I wanted to lay that out there just in case anyone needed to hear that. Like I said, when I'm trying to choose a topic, um, you look at kind of sometimes you're praying about it, you say, look, this is what's going on in in culture. This is what's going on around us. Does it need to be on Israel? Does it need to be on um, some doctrinal topic? Does it need to be on Halloween? And uh, what I was led to of all things this week was uh, Gideon for some reason. So I hope that there's someone out here because what I want to do is go into the story of Gideon and extract out the lessons from that. The way the Bible works is basically a collection of stories. And so often these stories, it's the format that God's choosing to give us for the lessons that are embedded in them. So he could just tell us, know this, know this, know this. But so often he does what he does and weaves these lessons into stories because story is the language in which humans communicate, is it not? I don't, we don't get together to tell each other facts. We get to tell, to tell each other stories and have discussions over the thing. That's way more um, enjoyable. And so we want to go through this story today. And as we go, we want to try to extract the lessons that are in it. Um, and as we can be thinking about it, and I'll try to draw out what, what, the, what the similarities may be for our society today, and some may be more grasping at straws, and some may be very clear. But if there's something, I would like just ask that everyone be thinking about how this story may apply to us where we are in our own walks, apply to us where we are today, and uh, as we get going in this. So we're coming in the period of the judges. So this is before, uh, before Israel had a king, and uh, we're coming off of um, the judgeship of, uh, of Deborah. And after the vanquishing of all the enemies of the Lord, uh, basically it says in uh, Judges 5, at the very end, it says the land had rest for 40 years. So there's a period of peace in Israel and that they get to enjoy. And as so often happens, um, is peaceful generations and easy times beget sinful generations. And that's what we begin to see here in chapter 6. It says that the children of Israel did evil in the sight of Yahweh, so he delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. Now, Midian, they're like cousins to the Israelites. They were actually of the descendants of, of Abraham, and they lived um, on, the, on the southeast side of the land of Israel. And uh, the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds, which are in the mountains. That's interesting. So they've essentially been getting raided and they're making their little forts and hideouts. And so it was whenever Israel had sown, the Midianites would come up. Also Malachites and the people of the east would come up against them. And then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza. So they're starting over here and they're working their way across Israel to, to the west side of it. And the Malachites are on the sort of the, the, the southwest side. And they're all kind of coming up here and, and they're Uh, destroying the produce of the earth as far as Gaza, leaving no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. 
For they come up with the livestock and their tents, coming as numerous as locusts, both they and their camels, without number. So they entered the land to destroy it. And presumably they wouldn't just destroy it. They'd take the food for themselves as well, I would imagine. Because why not? Let somebody else do the work. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to Yahweh. So this is a generation that's not so far removed from the Lord. It says they were serving him for 40 years. So they knew who, who God was. They knew the correct way to serve him, and yet they were falling away because they were not serving God. But they knew enough to call on him. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to Yahweh because of the Midianites that he sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. I brought you up from Egypt and I brought you out of bondage. I delivered you to the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them from before you and gave you their land. Also I said to you, I am Yahweh your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. God here is reminding them of what he's done for them. He's saying, don't you remember that I delivered you from bondage? Don't you remember who I am and what I've done for you? And so he's calling for the repentance. Now the angel of Yahweh came and sat under the terebinth tree, which is in Orpha, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. This is interesting of itself because you don't, you don't thresh wheat in a wine press. Most people don't thresh wheat at all. But when you do, you don't use a wine press. What he was doing uh, is instead of being on the threshing floor where you would do it, he's in a, a more secluded place where they wouldn't expect it to be. And he's trying to use a tool that's not intended for the job to get this grain done so they could have a modicum of something to eat. Because he did not want the Midianites to know what was there. And the angel of Yahweh appeared to him and said to him, Yahweh is with you, you mighty man of valor. And so we begin here with this. The messenger of the, God, of the Lord, he begins by speaking life into this man that God is going to use. Isn't it awesome that we serve a God who will come to us and not see us necessarily as we are, but who he intends us to build us up and to build us out to become? Remember that it says in Romans 4.17 that, that, well, we'll get there in a second actually. I don't want to jump the gun. But just know that it is awesome that God speaks life over this man. And that's our introduction. And Gideon said to him, Oh my Lord, if Yahweh is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where of all his miracles are great uh, wonderful works which our fathers told us about saying did not Yahweh bring us up from Egypt but now Yahweh has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites he's like it's like he's a little bit unaware here that it's the resulting actions of Israel and not God's unfaithfulness but he's about to learn then Yahweh turned to him and said this he didn't really answer one way or another he just says go in this might of yours and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? And so Gideon said to him, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. So it's starting to become, to us, become clear to us that he's not really a mighty man of valor. And he's not really uh, a man that is, um, how is it the, engine, uh, the, the angel said? In this might of yours. But when God puts a call on someone's life, if he's spoken it, it will be what it is. And so often we go first to our excuses, right? We first go to our human reasoning. I'm, I'm weak. I don't have experience in that realm. Just like Moses did. Moses said, I, I'm, 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 I'm poor of speech. We make the excuses because of our physical circumstances so often. And it's like we're not aware that God is of spirit and the spiritual realm that he operates in is not limited and held by the physical, what we see, touch, see, uh, smell, feel. 
it doesn't matter. But Gideon appeals to these physical circumstances. And the angel of Yahweh speaks on behalf of God here. And I think he is not at all being sarcastic when he says, go in this might of yours. He's taking what's a very young man, we don't really know how old he is here, who is doubtful, who is weak, who is, is found by the angel while he's in hiding, kind of doing, doing menial work. He says, go in this might of yours, you mighty warrior, basically. He knows something about Gideon that the Lord has sent him to do. In Romans 4.17, talking of Abraham, it is written, uh, Paul, Paul is speaking of Abraham. Romans 4.17. Oh, I turned right there. Wow. It says, As is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope and hope believes, so he became the father of many nations. So Abraham, by contrast here, Abraham heard what God said and believed him because God has this ability to call those things which do not exist as though they did. And this is what he's doing about Gideon. He addresses him not as who, where he stands in the present, but where he will be and for what he will be doing. And that's a really comforting thing to know about our God is that he sees us so much for our potential. He sees you for your potential. He doesn't see your present circumstances as something as a limitation. Actually, your circumstances are a feature to God, not a glitch. If you have circumstances that are limiting, that you believe keep you from service to the Lord, that's not a glitch. That's a feature for God. And we'll talk about why. Let's keep going in the story. Um, Judges, picking it up in the Judges 6, verse 17. And Yahweh said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. And then he said to him, If now I've found favor in your sight, then, then show me a sign that is you who talk with me. Do, do not depart from here, I pray, until I come to you and bring out my offering and set it before you. And he said, I will wait until you come back. And so Gideon went in and prepared a young goat, and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour, the meat he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot, and he brought them out to him under the terebinth tree and presented them. Now, there's, as an aside, there's some debate or discussion here as to whether or not um, uh, this, this was an offering like an offering unto the Lord. And it doesn't really appear as such necessarily. Um, it could be. Uh, it doesn't really, I don't think it makes much of a difference if it is or isn't. Uh, but... Uh, the, the um, stuff that was presented to him was not actually uh, consumed by the angel of God. The, God, the angel of God said this. Um, oh, let me back up, I'm sorry, to verse 19. So Gideon went in, prepared a young goat and unleavened bread with a of flour, and he put the meat in the basket, broth in a pot, and he brought them out to him under the terebinth tree and presented them. And the messenger of Yahweh said to him, or the angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on the shrock and pour out the broth. And he did so. And then the angel of Yahweh put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread and fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. And the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. He vanished. Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of Yahweh. So Gideon said, Alas, oh, so Yahweh, I've, I, for I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And then the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. So what's probably going on here is Gideon's thinking back to, um, in Exodus, it says that God is talking with his people and it says that those who see me face to face shall surely die. There is no one who can uh, face me in my full countenance and my full glory, essentially, face to face and die. And so he's worried. He's saying, look, look, I've seen the Lord or I've seen an emissary of the Lord. Am I going to die? Because uh, it says, those who, those, you shall not see the Lord and not die. But God assures him. Now, it doesn't say right now how, how the Lord's speaking to him. It says that the angel of the Lord vanished. And this is the Lord said to him. So whether the Lord is speaking to him or whether the angel has come back and he's speaking on behalf of the Lord or the angel is the Lord um, is really sort of moot to this story. But the Lord said to him, 
Peace be with you. Do not fear, you shall not die. And so Gideon built an altar there to Yahweh, and he called it, the Lord is peace. And to this day, it's still there. So the first thing we want to see is that Gideon is, um, Gideon doesn't really know who he's talking with at first. But he begins to perceive that something's a little different when he vanishes from his sight, right? And then he begins to understand he's speaking with a representative and or the Lord himself. And so he begins to understand that something is out of the ordinary here. Also, I think it's interesting to note that he was willing to share with this, with this visitor, not really knowing who it was. He didn't necessarily know it was the Lord because we only see as we progress that it was the Lord. But he was willing to share of the things that he had with him. It said that the, um, the enemy had been, the Midianites had been coming and robbing them of food, right? And that's why he was doing these meager ration preparations. And yet look how generous he is with this visitor. This actually could be one place where it says how many, there have been those uh, who have unawares shared, um, shared their food with uh, what turned out to be angels of the Lord. That's a New Testament verse, but it could be remembering back to, to examples in the word just like this. And so Gideon builds the first of the altars. And it's about this time, I think he's probably starting to think, wow, everything is changing for me. This is going to go quick. Now it came to pass the same night that Yahweh said to him, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the wooden image that is beside it and build an altar to Yahweh your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement and take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. Something to point out here I think is interesting. Sometimes we put so much stock into the things of the world or the things of the earth that we say that that's not fit for service to God. But no, notice what God has done here. He has said, I'm going to take the place of the altar and I'm going to build it on top of this thing. I'm going to exert my dominance and superiority by having, not only you, you tear it down, but you're going to build it on top of this place. Now, some people might say, oh, you shouldn't build an altar to God at the place where a, a Baal uh, uh, altar was set up. Well, God says otherwise. God said in this place, you will build it on top of there. It will show my dominance over this false God, over this false spirit. And then further, you're going to take the wood of the image and you're going to make a burnt sacrifice with that wood to me. Now, normally we'd be like, oh no, Lord, let it not be so. Let me, let me go get a pure tree. But I just think it's an interesting aside that he is, he is using, God is having him use these things in the offering in order to show that God is superior in every way over Baal. And so Gideon took 10 men from among his servants and did as Yahweh had said to him. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night. So you have a little bit of a dichotomy here. You have a man who on one hand is very willing to go and obey, but you have a man who is fearful of doing it. And it's really easy to point fingers at this, but I think if you think about it in more modern contexts, what if God came to you and told you in very certain terms, I want you to go tear down the Planned Parenthood on the corner over there overnight, or not overnight, I just want you to go tear down the Planned Parenthood. Yikes, that's like a criminal act. Probably wouldn't want to do it during the day. So he goes by night. Let's just make it, let's make it not an illegal thing. I want you to go pray outside that Planned Parenthood. Okay, that's something that's a little bit more challenging, but still like something that has potential legal repercussions with it. We have seen in this society um, that you can be prosecuted unjustly for being even present outside of a facility like that. Now, more so in other countries where they actually even punish you now in England, they're trying to do that for thought crimes. If you're even thinking about being out there and praying to yourself in your own head by your admission, they're currently trying to prosecute that. Believe it or not. And it probably won't be long before that's here. But you see that he's, he's fearful to go out. Even the Lord has come directly to him and said, I will be with you. 
But yet he still obeyed. And I think so often the matter-of-fact language of the biblical passages we read like can, can, can color how we interpret it or think it went. So it's like when we read these, sometimes it's easy to kind of divorce the text of what it says that happened with like what the character is really having to go through. He's going through a legit, like probably crisis of the mind here. He was minding his own business. And that same night now, uh, he was minding his own business earlier that day, grinding grain. And now he's finding himself tearing down uh, his father's altar to Baal, which apparently is something of value to the men of the city as well. The, the implication actually uh, here, he, has, he said his father had, uh, Gideon took 10 men from among his servants. Um, it's very likely his father was a prominent man of the city, just from the, the amount of wealth that's, that's being talked about here. And so when he said it was his father's altar to Baal, it could have been one that it was um, prominently uh, displayed for the whole city. Going on in Judges 628. And when the men of the city rose early in the morning, there was the altar Baal tore down and the wooden image that was beside it cut down and the second bowl was being offered on the altar which had been built. And they said to one another, who has done this thing? And when they had inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash has done this thing. And then the men of the city said to Joash, this is Gideon's dad, bring out your son that he may die because he has torn down the altar of Baal and because he has cut down the wooden image that was beside it. Now, we have actually seen in political discourses, and as, as the country uh, finds its way going further away from God, we begin to see um, mobs, not unlike this, forming. We begin to see mobs pulling down statues. We see mobs running amok in cities. We've seen that over the last few years as this spirit of unrest comes over the land. And this mob actually... Um, seems to be able to be quelled fairly, fairly quickly. Probably has God's hand against them. Uh, but the father uh, tries to actually reason with them. And Joash said to all who stood against him, would you plead for Baal? And this is his statue, or his, his altar, remember. Would you plead for Baal? Would you save him? Let the one who would plead for him be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him plead for himself because his altar has been torn down. And therefore, on that day, uh, Joash called uh, Gideon, that's implied there, Jerubbabel, saying, let Baal plead against him because he has torn down his altar. So he gets named a new name or a nickname by his dad, saying, let Baal uh, plead because he's torn down his altar. Isn't that interesting how names would work in the Bible so often? Now, now Gideon actually had a name, uh, his meeting had a name. Yeah, would you like to know what his, his name means? One who has a stump in place of a hand, as would be expected, I guess, right? Like, why wouldn't it mean that? It actually means, it does mean that, um, but it means feller. Not like the hey feller, but like one who f- cuts something down. Great warrior and one who pulls down. So isn't it interesting that God sees us and, and has, has already spoken over our life in some ways before we're even born because this, this man has a name that speaks to what his destiny was. Is that true of you? I don't know about Chelsea because her name means port of ships. <laughs> but what about you? It may or may not be, and that's okay, but we know in Bible times that so often men were named and they grew into what that name meant. And so now it's interesting that his father's calling to him, let Baal uh, decide, essentially. Let Baal, uh, let Baal plead against him because he's torn down his altar. So all the Midianites and Amalekites, this is in verse 33 now. All the Midianites and Amalekites, the people of the east, gathered together and they crossed over and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. And this is where stuff's starting to get real. So the Midianites are coming again, but God has other plans. Midian, uh, Gideon, he's proven on this one little test to be obedient, but he's still fearful. 
But check out what he does next in verse 34. But the spirit of Yahweh came upon Gideon, and then he blew the trumpet, and the Abizrites gathered behind him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also gathered behind him. And he also sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they came up to meet him. This is the beginning of his calling. And notice he makes the first move here in his call to arms. And it was the spirit of God who made the move through him. Gideon didn't decide, I'm going to do this myself. In fact, he probably didn't want to do it himself at that point. It was the spirit of the God that came upon him and said, let's get going. And really, at that, that, at that time, the stuff starts to get real. You have men assembling throughout Israel, this region of Israel, starting to come, um, bringing their arms, meeting up underneath the direction of Gideon. They're somehow recognizing that this young man is going to be their leader because he's the one that blew the horn and is by the leadership of the Spirit of the God. And stuff's starting to get real, and he's in charge, and oh boy, he's starting to get a little worried maybe. Because like, God inspired him to go blow that trumpet, but then, ooh, what's next? People are assembling and they're looking to me and what am I supposed to do? So Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have said, look, uh, I'm going to put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor and if there's dew on the fleece only and it's dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece and a bowl full of water came. And then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me, but let me speak just once more. Let me, let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece and let it not be dry. Oil on the fleece, but on the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. And it was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on all the ground. And so we don't know how much time has elapsed here between now and when, when God had first come, sent the angel of the Lord to him and where we're at now. But a lot is happening. And a lot has happened. Judges 7, verse 1. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the will of Herod, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north. Verse 2, and the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Now, therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart. At once from Mount Gilead, and the 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. Remember that 10,000 number. But Yahweh said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I'll test them for you there. And we all know the story. God brought them down to the water, and those that lapped with their hands um, were allowed to stay. Uh, and then the rest who, who got down on their knees to drink water, they got sent home. And a lot got sent home because all that were left were 300 men. Uh, the initial 32,000. And then the Lord said to Gideon, by 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. And so now, put yourself in Gideon's shoes. Just a minute ago, he was asking God for confirmation. Is this really what's supposed to happen? Because I got people assembling under me. They're looking to me. And now he's probably wondering what in the world's going to go. But at least it's only 300 people to, to have to navigate through right now. At least it's not 32,000 that are looking to me. So maybe that's, maybe that's a plus. And so the people took provisions and their trumpets, and he, God, uh, he sent away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those 300 men. And the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. And God being merciful, and God understanding the hearts of men, began to speak to Midian. And he said to him that night, verse 9, Arise and go down to the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. And if you're afraid to go down... Go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say. And afterward, your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. And so, because I think he needed all the confirmations he could get, he went down. Now the Midianites and the Malachites and all the people of the east were lying in their valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number as the sand by the seashore in the multitude. 
And when Gideon had come among these hundreds of, or thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of men, he just happens to come into the right place at the very right time. What are the odds? And he hears a man speaking to his companion, telling a dream to his companion, saying, I've had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian, and it came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. That's a really random dream, guys. But guess what? His companion answered and said, well, this is nothing else but the sword of Gideon from the son of Joash, the man of Israel. Into his hand, God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshiped. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, look, arise, for Yahweh has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. So God's given him a lot of confirmations at this point. He's given him the, the staff that, that causes the rock to consume the offering. He's given him words that he's obviously hearing either from an angel or from the Lord himself. He's given him a fleece that, that becomes uh, wet. He's given him a fleece another night that becomes dry. And now I think it's like the fifth sign. He's giving him this random word of prophecy some, from some random enemy in the crowd. And then another guy knows the exact interpretation. So at that point, Gideon's ready to roll. He says, I, I got it. I got it. And he's ready to lead the people to victory. And so Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came to the outpost of the camp. This is verse 19. Oh, he's talking about, I'm sorry. He tells them the, basically the strategy. He says, look, God's delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. And he divided the 300 men into three companies. This is verse 16. And he put a trumpet into every man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. Now, it never says if this is the strategy that God gave him, but it's the strategy that God used. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. And when I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then you also blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So he's, he's wise to put the emphasis on God first. And so Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch just as they had posted the watch and they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew their trumpets and broke the pitchers and they cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon and every man stood in his place all around the camp and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. And when the 300 trumpets, uh, when the 300 trumpets blew, Yahweh set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp and the army fled and all the men of Israel gathered together to pursue. And um, basically the aftermath of the pursuit, they overtook and even captured kings um, and pursued them to the other side of the Jordan. It goes on in chapter 8 to talk about some different military campaigns that Gideon went on to lead. But it doesn't really say if they were or were not ordained by the Lord. It could have been that, that Gideon saw what God had done and decided to continue going. But basically, the narrative just says that basically they are what they are. Here's what happened. And it's left to, to make a moral judgment on them, more or less. So we see God having taken someone who was reticent, hesitant, doubtful, timid. He speaks life over him. He's patient with him. He provides him everything he needs. All Gideon had to do was essentially show up and be faithful to what God told him. And look what God did from him from there. This, this actually put him in such a good standing instead with the men of Israel that we see in Judges 8, 22, that the men of Israel said to Gideon, rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. So we see their, their um, desire for a king beginning early. This is well before uh, Samuel and Saul. Uh, Samuel, um, the last judge, chose Saul. They're asking for a king, and, and he had sense enough to say, no, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you, but Yahweh shall rule over you. Um, 
But he did make a request of them, that they gave him earrings from the plunder, and they all gave him um, the earrings from their plunder because the, the people they had conquered uh, were Ishmaelites. The implication is that they all had golden earrings. And so there's a lot of them. Um, and so they gladly gave them. And we fast forward to see Gideon has done something that he ought not have. In verse 27, it says, Gideon made it into an ephod and set it up in his city, Orpah, and all Israel played the harlot with it there. And it became a snare to Gideon into his house. But then it wraps up the whole thing, basically. It says, thus Midian was subdued before the children of Israel, so they lifted their heads no more, and the country was quiet for 40 years in the days of Gibeon. This story is a little difficult for us, maybe, because it doesn't really have, like, a clean ending. We, we want, in our stories from the Bible, we want our characters to be so black or white, don't we? We want to see the good guy, and the good guy continue to live out his purpose. We, we hate it when Solomon falls away at the end of his reign. We hate it when David has the misstep with Bathsheba. We hate it when we see they did good and followed the Lord, but in these, these lineages of Israel, and then they tell us what it was that they didn't do. But isn't this the story of our own walks as well? Maybe we hate it because we recognize it in our own lives to an extent. What is the call that God is putting on your life right now? You were born, your kids were born for this time by God's design. It's not an accident that you're here right now at this time in history for a purpose. What is the call God's putting on your life? And if you don't know, that's okay. At the time of Gideon, he didn't know what God was asking him to do straight away. He didn't know what his future portended. But God did. And God knows the exact future that he wants and created you for in your life. And the fact is, is that whether or not we're in the end times right now, we're, everyone is in their own little form of end times. Everyone's life has a time appointed to end. Now, Jesus may come back before uh, we naturally pass and our, end time is a, our appointed time arrives. I hope so. I really do think it's going to be in our lifetimes. That's Justin's speculation. That's Justin's opinion. But we are here at this time, regardless of whether he's coming back tomorrow, the next day, 10, 20, 30, 50, 1,000 years from now, we are put here for a purpose and a time to walk out the role that God has written in the books for us to do. The first step comes in understanding and just basically acquiescing to what that plan is. It's being willing to lay down what it is that you have going that's so important in your life so that God can have his way to work with you. In Gideon's life, it was trying to make the food for the week. He was grinding up, grinding up some flour so they could have food that, the, 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 that wouldn't be taxed or taken by the, the neighboring bands of robbers. It was whatever he was doing as the son of what looks to be a wealthy man in town. He was willing to give that up. Second thing is it's really important as we're trying to determine what this is to be able to distinguish and understand what is God's voice, what is the hand of his calling in my life. And you may each hear God's voice differently. Even in this account, um, it seems that God communicated through different ways at different times with Gideon. One seemed to be through an angel or a messenger of the Lord. The other just says, the Lord said. And other things, it was, it was prophecies. He was hearing his future being spoken out by the enemy of all things. The circumstances may come from different places. The words of wisdom may come from different ways. The prophecies even maybe may come from different and sundry places. But we have to be willing to understand and hear them and not just write things off as coincidence. The other side of that coin is we start looking at every little blade of grass and thinking, well, it's obviously pointing to <laughs> the, the place over there. I better go there, right? So, but it means being able to distinguish and discern what is God's will and voice for me. 
Right now we have a presidential candidate who is uh, who has an, uh, uh, been a, had a reporter interview him and says, do you, do you believe that God is calling you to run right now? And he says, yes, I do. Meanwhile, he's got tens of people showing up to his rallies. So maybe his determination of what God's will for him or his own determination of what is will for him, they could be two very different things. And the same goes for us in our lives. Whose will are we seeking? Are we seeking the will that we want for our lives and interpolating that and applying that back and saying, this must be God's will for me? Are we truly willing to hear and go? I've told this story before, but uh, a few years back while praying, the Lord uh, spoke in a way that wasn't like audible, but it was clear enough to me that it was probably not myself. And he asked me to abstain from alcohol. And I didn't want to do that. I wasn't willing to give that up. And it took him, uh, I guess, a year and a half or two years before I understood what he was asking me to do in a different way because he shook me a little. And I interpreted that as, oh, this is what I was supposed to do all along. And so he was clear about that. But wouldn't it be better if we did it the first time? (laughs) The other thing we see with Gideon once he understands this call is he says, he starts to make excuses. He says, I'm not strong enough. I'm not big enough. I don't have enough experience. What excuses are you making? We all have our reasons and our excuses. Mine was, I really like a beer or two. Wine makes food taste better. It's biblical. But what are the excuses you're making? And are you willing to lay them before God? Look, God loves working with those who are weak and inexperienced. He goes to Gideon, who is timid, afraid, not a warrior, and he speaks it over him as though he is. Why? 1 Corinthians 1, 27 answers this. It says, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. You could say God has chosen the weak of the world. Uh, I actually said you don't have to say that because it says it in the next verse if I would have just continued. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put shame to the wise and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. God used the weak man in the person of Gideon in nearly only 299 others to destroy tens if not hundreds of thousands. Why? God chooses the base things of the world and the things which are despised he's chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. (laughs) And why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. Like Ashley was saying, God needs someone who starts humble and stays humble so he can work with you. When we first started Oakstone, there was a desperation that we had in each of us for God to be for God to be in it and with us, and what we needed to do. Uh, When we first started, I was learning six songs. A lot of us, uh, all the worship team, was learning like six songs a week. There was like a like like a um, desperation for Him to be in all that. And He met us where we were at. I was willing to take that. So what excuses are you making? Because God is capable fully of overcoming them. And then using your weakness to bring glory to himself because he has taken the weak and base things and allowed them to do great things. And that is like the story of just about every character he has in the Bible. What is it that is keeping you from walking out your mission with God? And then once you do find that mission, can you walk it out with the desperation and the desire to hold on to God? The reason Gideon's story didn't end the way we like it to end, all tied up in a neat little bow, is because he began to trust in the things of the world, to trust in the things of the earth, to trust in his own power, perhaps, 
Granted, he didn't become king, but he asked for this amount of wealth to be sent to his way, which he then used to help draw the people into sin. And then he went on to have a bunch of wives, which sort of, sort of not really smiled upon. But the one that he had as a concubine, that son actually ended up destroying his entire family. It said he had 70 sons, and the one he had via this concubine ended up murdering all but one of them. The story doesn't end cleanly for him. It, it, it goes where he, I find the arc of his story to go like this. He's, he, he doesn't trust God. Uh, he's afraid. He's timid. The spirit activates him. He blows the trumpet. All things happen. He's riding high. And then he begins to trust in his own self in some ways. And he falls back down here. And his family sort of falls apart over time. These things were given to us for our, our examples, for our admonitions, so that we can learn. And I really like this story. I like the first half of this story. But we should let the back half of the story also be a warning to us. Say, like, good, God can work through us. But if we begin to take it on to ourselves and begin to allow ourselves to be exalted in any way, shape, or form, or we begin to follow our own pursuits of pleasure in the aftermath of God having used us, well... We'll, we'll get our own reward. But the story of Gideon, the first half, it's beautiful in that it inspires us. It inspires us to say, look, how is it God can use me? Will I follow? Can I do it faithfully? Now, in this story, it's God shows great grace in all the five times he asked for things. But can we do it faithfully and in trusting that he will, he will show up on our behalf? And once we have, will we be faithful to go forward into the, the job, the battle, the spiritual war, whatever it is that God has for us? Because he has a job for you at this time or else you wouldn't be here. Our jobs as Christians are so much more than showing up here and filling seats. And so I hope that this serves as an inspiration to each of us because there's so much that God has for each of us to do in our lives. If you don't know what it is yet, be seeking him on that. Be praying to him on that, that he would make it clear and reveal. God is activating an army of believers, not for physical warfare, but for spiritual warfare against the forces of darkness that are ever rising that are ever encroaching, that are coming against God. And as we see the day nearing, getting nearer, these physical forces of darkness, or these spiritual forces of darkness, will be ramping up and ramping up. And that's what we see right now. Let us be seeking what it is that we can do. Putting aside all the things that distract. Being willing to give up the things that hold us back. And be willing to go forward. And then having started the business that God uh, has, has led us to do, to finish it well. I said one thing earlier, uh, and it was in regard to, um, it was in regard to, uh, I said, remember the number 10,000. I'm afraid I lost the verse on that. Jesus, in uh, the book of Luke, Jesus says, who, uh, having put his hand to the plow, will look back. Or who, uh, having started to build, uh, will um, not count the cost before considering construction. Because basically, if you start something without counting the cost, it'll look foolish to whoever's observing around you if you don't finish what you started. And then he says something actually really interesting. I can't find the verse. I apologize, so I'm going to have to paraphrase it. I didn't make it into my notes, I guess. But what he said was this. Or what king wanting to wage war with 10,000 doesn't first take note as to whether he's going to war against 20,000? I find it interesting 
that the same king who was behind what started at 10,000 people, this king didn't need to wager whether the 10,000, uh, or Gideon didn't need to wager whether it was 10,000 enough to fight the, the hordes and the hundreds of thousands because the king that mattered had already judged it as so. He had already written it and declared it as such and he was gonna do his will. So let's go forward with that faith that God has already won the battle. He's the one that goes before us. He is the one that wins the battle in ways we would not comprehend, like blowing trumpets and breaking pots. Let's go forward in the, the battle that he has given us to fight, being willing to go faithfully, without questioning God, learning from the example of Gideon, uh, because he's a, it's a really cool story. So just wanted to share that with you guys. I hope that has value. I don't know, again, why I was led to this story today, but I hope, I hope that resonates, and I hope that we can go find the roles that God has given us um, as we're in these last days. So let's praise him.